excited to talk about this topic because it's near and dear to my own heart. Um, as someone who grew up in a family with a brother who had, you know, undiagnosed, untreated ADHD, and um, who, after going through menopause, I've realized that I have uh, some mild ADHD as well, particularly around emotional control, just feeling things so deeply and intensely. Um, and a little bit with time management, to be honest. Always thinking I can do more in a certain amount of time than there's actually time for. Um, but in this, uh, you know, session, um, we're going to talk about, you know, mostly my experience growing up in a family where I was the neurotypical uh, sibling, um, and uh, basically um, have functioned that way for my whole life. So Mia is from Finland. Hi, nice to see you. And Christine is from Ottawa. Nice to see you too. So, you know, I'd love you to put something in the in the in the chat about, you know, a question that you might have about parenting neurotypical siblings or what it's like for you to live in a family if you have a neurotypical sibling. So, one thing that I want to talk about today is that, you know, while raising kids with ADHD can be both simultaneously exciting and fun, it can also be frustrating and rewarding. Uh, being the neurotypical sibling of someone with ADHD is equally quite complicated. And um, typically, the sibling relationship, of course, is the longest relationship that we have in our lifetime. No one else shares our family history or our story. No one else has seen the ins and outs of parental relationships, or no one else can uniquely provoke your anger and uh, frustration the way a sibling can. So we have a few more people joining. Sonia from Long Beach. Heather, hi. Uh, Sonia, you're neurotypical and your boys are neurotypical and I find it uh, awesome but very hard. Well, so glad you're here. Mary, raising an older, mostly neurotypical sibling, however, does have symptoms of anxiety. Younger sibling has ADHD diagnosed. They trigger each other. That was kind of my situation in my family. Honestly, I had a lot. I had anxiety. And, you know, some some people still think that's what's going on. Um, it's, my prim it's definitely my primary issue for sure. Um, and uh, my younger sibling had ADHD, so we triggered each other. Do you have recommendations on how to help siblings feel like they're getting adequate attention from parents? We feel like we give our ADHD son 80% of our attention and um, our other two only 20%. You know, I'm going to talk about that today, so that's great. Um, so one of the things that happens in families with and without ADHD is that sometimes siblings get along. It's a good fit. They understand each other. And sometimes um, siblings don't really get along. And when they don't really get along, it's particularly difficult if we're throwing ADHD into the mix uh, because of reactivity and higher levels of frustration. Um, in fact, you know, often neurotypical siblings of kids with ADHD are, or, neuro, or neurodivergent kids are often encouraged to accommodate, to tolerate, and overlook issues that actually probably infuriate, scare, or embarrass them. Um, as I said, I've not only seen these patterns in my practice for years, but have lived them as well. Um, you know, um, my mother used to say to me, Sharon, you have to understand your brother. But I was just so frustrated and exhausted from living with him. Why did I need to understand him? And why couldn't I have a normal sibling like everyone else? Um, he also had a lot of jealousy toward me and um, resented me um, that for things that you know came easily and went well. So it was a really tough combination. And we know that kids with ADHD are often the focus of parental worry and concern. The child with ADHD may envy their neurotypical siblings and their ease at school or extracurricular activities or friendships. And they may feel some anger or rage from these comparisons towards themselves, but they also sort of project outward towards the sibling or other members of the family. All of these emotions, difficult to discuss and manage, can result in epic meltdowns that throw everybody off. 
Um, so I hear from a lot of neurotypical siblings about their frustration, fear, and sometimes even pity for a brother or a sis sis sister who struggles with complex ADHD. Themes of fairness, inclusion and exclusion, competition and avoidance run through family and individual sessions with these folks. Um, the non-ADHD siblings may talk about their embarrassment, why is their sibling acting this way with daily meltdowns, school struggles, etc. Uh, frustration, why can't they stop their annoying behaviors when they're asked. Um, guilt, why does my sibling have challenges and I don't? Things seem easier for me and that's hard also. Um, and the pressure they feel to be the good kid. How can I be different from my ADHD sibling and not cause stress? Um, they can be angry, discouraged, empathic, or fe fiercely independent. And it's the unpredictability of the family dynamics that really kind of throws them off and, and this perception of a lack of fairness. And so a lot of times a neurotypical siblings can, are really tired of being you know, considered the other one. And in fact, there's a book out called Being the Other One that was written quite a while ago, but it talks about, um, it's by a, a, a woman, I believe, who, who had a sibling who had a disability, a physical disability, and what that was like for her. So let's go to some questions uh, and start our conversation here. Paulette asks, how can we strengthen our neurotypical children's relationship with their ADHD brother? Um, that's a really good question. And this kind of goes into that fairness issue about uh, how to help siblings feel like they're getting adequate attention. So one of the issues that comes up in families living with a neurotypical and a neurodivergent child or children is the sense that the neurodivergent child, the child with ADHD or a learning disability or AST, or twice exceptionality gets mu many more, um, you know, um, much more attention uh, on a day-to-day -day basis than the neurotypical child, and um, and the neurotypical child can often resent that child. Um, and also feel angry to the parents. But it's hard to be angry at parents for whom, from whom you want attention. So when you're angry with your parents because you're not getting enough attention, um, that's going to push them away, right? Or it's going to you know, engage in a negative exchange of, of, of attention that may not feel very good. So you'll uh, shift that. We'll see kids shifting that to their sibling where they can be angry safely. Um, because then their sibling will get angry. And, and, and brothers and sisters are very good at knowing just which buttons to push that will set off a sibling so that the, it looks like the sibling has caused the event when actually it's been a mutual co-conspiracy. So, um, so let's go um, to some other questions. So when we want to strengthen the neurotypical child's relationship with their ADHD older brother, part of what we want to do is try to find some common ground, things that kids like to do together, something that we can do as a family. Can you go miniature golfing without the ADHD brother having a meltdown? Um, what kinds of activities um, might you be able to do together as a family that meet everyone need, meets everyone needs? And in some families, that's easier because their kids are closer together. But some families, there can be a, a six or seven year difference between two children, and that makes it much harder. Um, and so it to, you know, one child doesn't want to be dragged along. The other child feels like it's never their turn to make decisions. So we want to try to create activities where there is a sense sense of shared um, uh, participation and, and interest as, as much as possible. Um, Roberta says, I had an ADHD diagnosis several years ago and then had a stroke. It made it so much worse. Yes, I'm sure it did. Um, uh, Heather says, my son and I both have ADHD. He's an only child. And Paulette says, our three children are teens now. Is it too late to help them get along better? Absolutely not. Why not try to think about something that teens like to do that everyone could do together? It may be something that's food related. It might be, you know, a, 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 you know in a particular fun adventure. Um, maybe you're going to go see... Um, 
a concert together or a special sporting event, um, or um, maybe you're going to go on a, a road trip to have a magical mystery tour day and visit a beach you've never been to. Um, so, you know, it, one of the things that helps is if the parents are really together as a team. So if your kids don't like a decision that you made as parents, they can bond up together against you. And that actually, although that seems, sounds really unpleasant, it actually builds closeness among siblings. Um, uh, because, you know, you both can be like, oh, our parents, blah, 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 instead of um, kind of a divide and conquer uh, situation. Um, so, so I think the thing that I would want to do to try to build relationships among siblings is to really think about and sit down and brainstorm what are some, you know, outings, activities, meals, movies, anything that you could do that everybody could do together. Everyone doesn't have to get along all the time and they, you may have complaining, but you're still engaged together in an activity. Um, let's see, Christine, hi. I'm looking into getting a diagnosis of ADHD in my 40s. Challenging to tell if my kids need a diagnosis as well or if they're neurotypical. Um, getting chores done in a timely fashion is a huge issue. All I can say is it is exhausting having my chores take me so much longer than everyone else. I can see that. And you know, Christine, what you might want to do is, you know, either shrink the size of your chores by, by making the chore itself somewhat smaller, like a micro chore, and then get it done and set up a couple of those for yourself so you feel like you're on your way. You might want to think about family chore time where everyone's doing something together and give yourself an extra five minutes if you need it. Um, so one of the things that we want to do as, as, as parents and caregivers is to reduce what, what I call splitting in a household, which means that one child is the good child and one child, although you may not say that, is perceived as the bad or problem child. And what happens in situations like this is that the good child continues to, to, to to thrive, succeed, and avoids anything that might cause conflict in a family. And the so-called problem child, even when they are efforting to make a difference and do something in a, new, in a new way to build a skill, it doesn't get a lot of attention because they're not actually accomp accomp excuse me, accomplishing it. Sometimes in families there is this un unconscious or unspoken comparison between kids um, and they're aware if you're neurodivergent that you have a sibling who can do things that you can't do. And that's very difficult, particularly if you're the older child. And there can be a lot of disdain and criticism toward the younger child um, as a result of that. Um, so what we want to really think about is are the role assignments in your family kind of rigid, you know, and if, if so, how can we foster, you know, the helping the good child kind of mess up and how can we help the, pro the identified problem child do well and how can we talk up doing well in the family and also really acknowledge that, that the other child um, you know, gets to not be perfect, gets to, you know, have a problem, have a meltdown, cry, feel anxious, be worried. That's okay. It's part of living. Uh, Lacey says to Christine, I just got diagnosed six months ago. I'm 43 and I feel your pain, lady. Good for you, Christine. I mean, good for you, Lacey, for sharing that and offering some support to Christine. And I think, you know, if you feel like ADHD is happening for you, then it's worth pursuing a diagnosis. So let's look at how we can level the playing field in families. So first of all, we want to notice what each child is doing well every day. And this might be a high and a low at the dinner table. It might be what one of my clients calls a happy and a crappy. It could be a rose and a thorn, however you want to frame it. But to sit down at the table so everyone goes around and says something like that. And if your teenagers, you know, kind of roll their eyes or protest that it's corny, you'll say, you're right, it is corny, but we're going to do it anyway because we're family. And sometimes we do things um, that are part of being a family, even if they're corny. 
Now, fairness doesn't mean equality. And most people uh, in families, most kids in families in particular, think fairness means equality. But actually what fairness means is a feeling of being listened to and included. So you as a parent need to expect negotiations and creating plans that include something that appeals to everyone or taking turns. It's natural to have expectations about you know, all kinds of things, whether it's homework or academics or activities or chores or bedtime, and that these will differ among your children according to their age their capability and 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 what um, needs to be done so you can't have you wouldn't expect a six-year-old to do the same thing as a ten-year-old but a lot of times if you have a ten-year-old with ADHD and a six-year-old who doesn't their capability for doing chores and staying on task may not be that far apart if we take in that the three the three-year lag in maturity in the ADHD brain and so instead of 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 creating um, activities or part chores that your child actually cannot do, let's try to create things that they actually can do. And the more collaborative you are in creating those tasks, the better it's going to be for the family and for everybody's different roles and flexibility. The next thing we want to talk about is to transform any accommodations into adjustments. So when one child feels like a burden um, uh, and has to repeatedly accommodate the needs of another, resentment builds in that sibling towards the sibling but also towards the caretaker. And sometimes that the resentment toward the parent may not be released or talked about until much later on, years even, and sometimes it can happen immediately. So um, one, what, what can happen is that the neurotypical sibling or the neurodivergent sibling may reject the other person because it's too hard to be in relationship with them, there's too much anger or jealousy um, or um, in general just kind of negative feelings and so there's a lot of rejection and criticism that goes on um, and, and what we want to do instead is of trying to everybody trying to change each other is that we make some compromises we acknowledge where people are and we meet them there that's the second C of my five C's of ADHD compassion meet people where they are not where we think they should be and so a compromise is, is what we want to teach our kids how to do. Because a compromise is a negotiation. And a lot of people think that the negotiation means eventually like one person capitulates, you know, gives in, and the other person is the victor. Is the, um, the victor. And that's not how it works. You know, in a good compromise, everybody's a little dissatisfied. So what we want to do instead when we're building um, compromise is we want to help our kids understand that we can set up a situation where not everyone is going to be happy with the result, but it's a result that, uh, that adjusts to everybody's needs according to their means, so to speak. So um, we want to come up with solutions that make sense for the system rather than only work for the specific individual. Uh, Lacey says, I only found out because my 10-year-old son has it and I was learning more and more about ADHD and I had a lot of the symptoms he had. Now him and I have common ground and get along better. That's wonderful, Lacey. One thing that you can do in families is instead of focusing on the ADHD diagnosis, you can work on building executive functioning skills. So I talk about this in my work and so do so many experts on attitude, understanding what executive functioning skills are and working towards improving an executive functioning skill for everybody. So let's say organization is a family uh, is, is something that the family could do better and it's not just the person who's neurodivergent with ADHD but everyone could do you know needs some support and assistance with organization then uh, that would be the goal that you work on so maybe at night before people go upstairs to bed you have a five minutes of a family uh, a family sweep where everyone goes around <clears throat> 
excuse me, and picks up, um, you know, a four or five of their things from the floor and puts them where they need to go. Um, and we all do it together, okay? So there's a family chore time where we're all doing chores together. This helps reduce sibling rivalry because it's not a sense of, you know, you do this and I do that. It's here's the time where we're all doing things um, simultaneously. And this can be very useful. So we want to make sure that where chores and activities are concerned that we, we, um, we work on certain uh, executive functioning skills across the board. And your neurotypical child and your neurodivergent child, they both will have executive functioning skills, strengths, and challenges. So you may want to work on something for your neurotypical child that is different than for your neurodivergent. Like your neurodivergent child might need help with impulse control, but your neurotypical child may need help with, um, uh, you know, um, uh, planning. So, so we're going to work on those skills separately but simultaneously. Mary says, we do what we call a 7 p.m. blitz. I love that. It's quick, quick pickups of maintaining the common areas. Great. And you can do a timer to make it fun or put um, some music on. You want to gamify it. You know, that, 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 that play of, uh, is really helpful. Julia says, my son is neurodivergent and my daughter is neurotypical but physically disabled. I'm having a hard time as they get older finding ways to encourage them to spend time together and enjoy it. I can imagine that's difficult, Julia. Thank you so much for sharing. I'd like to know if there's something that they enjoy doing. Maybe it's watching a TV show, but something where that is simple as that, um, but or playing a game of cards, um, going um, going somewhere with you. Uh, what is it that they actually enjoy doing together? And if it's only one thing, that's okay. It can only be one thing. But hopefully it could be two or three, so you could, you know, rotate them in and out. I'm curious if anyone um, feels like that they accommodate uh, their neurodivergent child um, and that a lot of their attention goes to that child. Um, I think someone earlier said that that's the case. And then what's the experience like for your other kids who feel like they don't get your attention? Do they act out to get it? Do they get angry with you? Do they tell you they want your attention? Um, do they put their hands on your face and say, you know, mom, I want you to look at me with your whole face, not over here or over there or at your phone? You know, what happens in your family? Please write that in the chat so we can have a conversation. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about in terms of this idea of kind of leveling the playing field is to set up what my uncle used to do with my cousins, which I call private time. So he would set up private time experiences. They had three children. I have three cousins on that in that family. And he would once a month do something private with, with each of the kids, something they enjoy doing with him, um, an activity or an adventure. Um, and uh, that, that was a way for him to kind of strengthen his relationship with them individually. I'm wondering what kinds of private time you could set up with each of your children per month. If you're a solo parent, can you, can you get someone to take care of the other child or the other child can be in an activity when you do it? If you have a co-parent, could you each do it simultaneously with a child or two? How can you set this up in your family? So. I want you to write in um, in, the, um, in the chat what are some ways that you can set up private time or uh, privates with your kids uh, so that you can have some positive alone time rather than having alone time be something that's pressured at home or about an activity or a chore. What are some activities, uh, private activities that you could do or how could you set that structure up? If you could share that, that would be great. Paulette says, now my neurotypical girl is very withdrawn from all of us. Yeah, does she feel like uh, kind of left out and that there's, you know, you guys are all together and there's no room for her? Is she frustrated uh, or uh, uh, um, 
hurt or angry. I'm wondering if there's a way to get some counsel, some family counseling, so you could have some conversations about things that might help her come back into the fold, what you could do for a private with her to build some positive uh, hanging out time. Um, she's withdrawn because she doesn't feel like you know, she's engaged or she matters or there's a tension for her. So we want to kind of bring her back by including her in something. Uh, she's, um, let's see, my other child is uh, now struggling more than the original LOL child. Okay, uh, it seems so obvious now. Wish I got a redo. So you have a redo every day with your kids. I've had some issues with my second child and you know, been to therapy and blah, 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 apologized, was accountable. You know what the redo is? Me just being steady showing up. That's the redo. I love them, I send them texts, I love them, and occasionally they call and I get to talk to them. So that's really great. So it, some of it is about your expectations, about what a relationship will look like. Some of it is about forgiving yourself for the ways that maybe you didn't show up and you would like to show up now. And even if a child says it's too late, you blew it, it's over, don't give up. Continue to show up in a loving way whether it's small or not, um, and keep the door open. Listen to what they have to say to you about how they feel X, Y, or Z. And instead of denying it, use that reflective listening and say, what I heard you say is this, uh, I bet that was frustrating, or yes, I can see how I did that and I truly regret it. Like, don't try to convince them that their experience in the family is incorrect. Instead, listen to them, validate, be accountable, and then change. Change your behavior so that you're doing one of the things differently that they, at, that they told you was really hard for them. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, she's very introverted, Paulette says. So um, it might be useful for the two of you to do a little counseling together so you can talk, or for the two of you just to start to, to find an activity that you two can do alone, and maybe on a weekly basis. She's, she's pulling in, and um, one thing I worry about when kids are very introverted, introverted and withdraw from the family is some depression. So we want to you won't want to connect with her. And even if that activity is you know, going to a store that you hate um, while you're with them, that you know, you're hanging out and you know, you're just present, that presence is what makes a difference because you have shown up. Paula says, I was the different, I was different one too. Uh, Heidi says, for private time, we keep it simple with walks and games and going to a coffee shop. I love that because in each of those things, there's engagement. Okay, now that's not you're going to sit down and have a face, super intense face to face, but you go to a coffee shop, you might get a treat, uh, you know, your child might get a treat and you enjoy the treat. You, you know, people watch, um, you might want to talk about something. Not that's not a big sensitive conversation, but something kind of light, maybe a TV show or a sports team or something that you know interests them. Particularly for kids right now who do a lot of gaming, if you have a child who's a gamer and you want to have some private time with them and they're like not super interested, one of the things could be sitting down with them and having them teach you how to play their game. Um, that might not be appealing to you, but it might be meaningful to them. Heather says, I'm a single parent of two neurodivergent kids. I do one on one time with, uh, with I do one on one time <laughs> with each every day, even if it's just 20 minutes. This gives me insight into how they are doing. That's wonderful. That's a great thing to do. And it's, and the, th the thing is, it's consistent and they know it's coming. And so they don't have to fight over getting your attention because they know they each get the 20 minutes. That's wonderful. Mary, we do one-on-one -on -one dates with each kid. We also have found extracurricular activities just for the neurotypical SIB, church, youth group, STEM classes. He gets time to focus on his needs and interests, right, away from the family. And then maybe an activity for the neurodivergent child um, that feeds them as well. 
and helps them develop an interest because developing an interest or a sense of competency is not only part of um, you know a, a, of, of of an essential part of childhood, um, particularly between the ages of eight and twelve, but it's also an essential part of 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 transitioning to adolescence and and living uh, fully as a, a as an adult with ADHD. They know that there are things that they're interested in and they're good at, so they have they develop a sense of competency. Heidi says, my neurotypical daughter is in counseling while my son with ADHD is not at present. Um, uh, maybe you could say a little more about that, Heidi, uh, about how that might uh, be affecting the family and if you think that your son might benefit from some family counseling or with you or maybe counseling is not what is needed at this point, but if your neurotypical daughter is getting it, I think that's important. Trisha. Thank you for reminding me that every day is a redo. Thank you, goosebumps. Most welcome. Mary, bless you. It's hard enough with my two kiddos and my husband. I, I hear you. Uh, oh, you're saying that to um, the other person, yes. Uh, we're trying to get her season tickets for theater so my husband or I can spend one-on-one -on -one time. She keeps refusing therapy. So, um, you know, when kids re refuse therapy, you can sort of incentivize them to go for you, right? So I know you don't want to go to therapy, but we're going to go as a family, and you're part of this family um, because things aren't really, you know, things need to be a little bit different, and here's how. I like the idea. Theater tickets sounds really fun. I'm a theater, I'm a theater fan, so you know that would work for me. Um, but it sounds like um, some counseling might be in order, and maybe it's worth talking to her primary care provider and setting up an appointment so the primary care provider can ask questions and check things out that you yourself really can't ask. Um, you know, I, my children are. Um, are grown and I have to tell you that um, on a recent holiday um, my son came with my grandson and my friends were there and they asked all the questions that I never get to ask. It was fantastic. We had a Seder, you know, a, a Passover Seder and um, they kept asking him about this and that and I was just like, yes! Because I want to an the answer to those questions but I couldn't ask them. So. Um, uh, you know, that's why it's sometimes nice to have like a little event with some other families because your kids might engage with other people and you might be able to hear a little something that you couldn't hear otherwise. Uh, Jessica, I did that during the pandemic with gaming. I downloaded Minecraft and my son taught me how to build and create. It has been such a wonderful experience. Good for you, Jessica. And Heather says, therapy can be so hard. We started therapy at a farm that offers play, art, and animal therapy. I find it engages the younger ones. Yes, you know, talk therapy is not for everyone, and not, not, uh, and not all family therapists are good at creating, you know, kind of a play or, or some drama or playing family games that draw, that draw out conversation. So whatever works is what's important, and you're doing something and that sounds great. Heidi, about counseling, I just mean everyone's needs can't be fully met at the same time. Correct, that's true. Right now the counseling is more needed for her even though she's neurotypical. Well good for you Heidi as the parent for seeing what the needs are and um, and, and, and addressing and uh, addressing them um, because that's part of actually being a really great parent is to see that this child needs this and this child needs that and so and they don't have to be the same thing um, so it's important to really again meet your kids where they are offer them love and acceptance um, as well as uh, compassion so another thing that really helps in terms of parenting in general, but particularly parenting different types of siblings, is to notice your own reactions to your kids. You know, we all have, if you are a parent, you have similarities with some kids and similarities with others, and some kids might be easier for you to parent than others. Um, let's be honest with yourself about that, because your kids pick up on what's going on for you. If something's easy, if something's challenging, um, if they're struggling, if you're struggling, that's really helpful. So you want to check your own attitudes to your children. Um, this idea that parents are impartial to their kids is kind of 
um, bogus. You know, we love our children for the, who they are and we love them differently, not necessarily better or worse or less than, but differently, you know, and we still adore them. Uh, the, and even if, even if we don't even like them, you know, I might be, say to my kids, you know, I don't like you right now, but I always love you. Um, I might say that to my husband particularly sometimes, but we want to be able to hear them if they say, I hate you, and you can say, I understand that you hate me right now. We're not liking each other very much, but this will pass and we'll come around to something else. So um, your, 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 your f members of your family watch how you interact with all the other members of the family. So if you can use humor, if you can um, zoom out uh, and maintain your perspective during a tense moment, um, if you are able to uh, help, you know, sort of jump in and, and, and you know, sort of um, assuage conflict without solving it, but by showing up. You, everybody's watching how you're doing it. And they take it in, and they may or may not be able to use it at that time, but they might use it later. And so it's really important that you are um, just aware of yourself and your own reaction to kid, your, your kids. And if you're really struggling with one, with one child, I suggest you seek some counseling or coaching so you know all your struggle lives in the consulting room rather than in your day-to-day -day relationship so your kids don't get a sense that you like one more than the other. Um, that is not a good feeling. Um, and it's and that can happen for grandparents also. Um, grandparents may have a draw for one child and not another. And this has happened in my family uh, with one of my parents who really, you know, clearly has a, more of a connection and favors one of my children over the other. And it, it's not great, I'm going to tell you. I mean, and, and to the credit of the unfavored child or less favored child, uh, that child you know, um, does check in with the grandparent and, you know, reaches out to them, but it, it's hurtful. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, Marissa, how do I respond to a close non-ADHD friend's parents blaming my ADHD son for their son also fiddling in a class when they are doing it together? The teacher confirmed both were distracted, um, but only my son was singled out. That is really unfortunate. I felt like she punched me in the face when she said my son needs to stay away from hers. They've been inseparable since grade K and now they are 16. So here's the thing, when you have a 16 year old, you can't really tell them who to be friends with and who not to be friends with. And so, you know, I can understand that you felt punched in the face when she said that to you. And I, I think it's worth, you know, if you ever see her or you want to say, you know what, our kids are 16. You know, they make a lot of decisions on their own. And if you're angry with my son, that's your right. But you can't banish him from your son's life. That's for them to figure out and work out. And this happens, kids are friends, then they're not friends, they may egg each other on. My son got the, you know, it's distressing for me, given our friendship, that you're taking this position. And I'd like, you know, I, I don't know exactly what to say or do to make it be different. And if you want to take space from me, that's fine. But let's let the kids figure this out on their own. And, and that's really important. Like you can take space from her and she can take space from you, but let the kids figure it out. Because if she says to her, her kid, don't you go near so-and-so, what does that you know, really teach that child about how to resolve conflict or how to treat people who are differently than you are? I mean, that's like, that's like cancel culture. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that and I don't support it. You're welcome, Georgia. And thank you to everyone also. Mary, is there a separate webinar to help parents with mental and with mental, physical, and emotional burnout? I get absolutely wiped managing everybody's relationship with each other, with another member of the family due to each of their challenges. Being the constant leader and hostage negotiator is exhausting. You know, I hear that. I don't know if we have a webinar about that, but I certainly think that would be a great idea uh, for a Facebook Live. I think that's cool. 
Heidi, what if the kids are 10? So I think, Heidi, your question is about, you know, a, a, how do you refra uh, respond to a friend who is, um, who is telling your, um, your, that you can't, kids can't play together. Um, to be honest, this happened to me uh, at one point, and essentially, I, I just really stayed away from the mother. The mother um, really, I don't know, whatever narrative she ran about me and my family, um, but she didn't like me, and, um, and she wouldn't let her son come to our house for a play date. Um, but she would sometimes let my son go to her house if it was with other kids. Um, my son was aware of this, that there were some issues that this child didn't come over anymore, um, but he was fine with going to that child's house. Um, so I think that, you know, what we want to do is to try to figure out, like, what are the parameters, if there can be a relationship, and if there can't be a relationship. What we want to tell our kids is, you know, sometimes relationships and friendships change. We, you know, we'll circle back and hope that, um, you know, you can hang out a little bit later. But right now, we're just taking some space, and that needs to happen. Um, so uh, thank you, Paulette. Um, so we have uh, like three more minutes left, and I'd love to answer any of your questions uh, that you might have about uh, families or sibling relationships. I can probably address this emotional burnout uh, question by Mary, so I think I'll do that. Um, so one of the things that's that that's difficult for parents is when you are try you know when you are set up or trying to manage everyone's relationship that is exhausting and it's not going to happen. Um, and actually, I forgot to post my little. Um, downloadable. Here you go. Sorry about that. Um, so it's exhausting and it's, an, it's a no-win situation. So yes, you are a cheerleader. Yes, you can be a negotiator. But the question is, when do you step in and when do you stay out? And, and you know, ideally, you step in when things are on the edge of boiling over into a physical problem. But ideally, what you want is to help your kids figure it out themselves. And that takes time and maturity. And so um, if you're wiped out managing everyone's relationship, then I think it's important that you get some you time. Um, I just read this really great book called um, Lessons in Chemistry. And I don't know if you've ever read this book, but it's kind of funny and very, it's very touching. And uh, the main character has this cooking show and she says on the cooking show, children, go set the table. Your mother needs a moment. And I love that. It's like, yes, your mother needs like 10 moments um, to recover from all the work that you're doing. But so Mary, what I think is important in your situation is, is there time for you during the course of a week where you can fill up your own bucket, right? Where you can feel like, oh, I've got some, um, some goodies for myself so I'm not running on empty and feeling depleted the whole time. I feel this today as a mom and a caretaker for my neurodivergent father. Um, yeah, it's, it's really exhausting to care for other people. And, you know, one of the things uh, that they say in Chinese medicine is you want to feed the mother and then you feed the child. And that's a, a, a term there. But it's kind of like the oxygen mask on a plane. You have to put it on yourself first before you put it on someone else. And so if you're burnt out, the thing that I would say to you is, A, what can you do that's less? What can you cut out? And B, what are you doing to fill yourself, to help yourself feel nurtured? And if the answer is nothing and nothing, then you're going to continue to feel burned out. So what is one small thing that you could do? Maybe it's just walking down the block and back every day. Start small so you can actually do it and feel accomplished in doing it. Um, Ismani says, uh, I feel your pain, Mary. I'm in the same boat, and it doesn't help that I have ADHD as well. So a lot of us are running on empty, particularly, I think, around now, you know, like the school year. If we're parents, we got to get through the end of the school year. We want our kids to pass and complete their homework, and there's always, like, activities going on, and you're kind of worn out. Um, you, you are worn out from parenting. So really ask yourself, like, what is it? 
that you could do that would fill up your bucket? Put a drop or two in your own bucket. And what is something that you do that you might be able to set aside for a week or two to give yourself a, a, a more of a sense of space? Um, Mary, yes, I stay up way too late enjoying the quiet time when everyone is asleep, but the lack of sleep catches up with me by Thursday. I will find something in addition to that staying up too late. So one option might be staying up let you know basically going to bed a little bit earlier and maybe waking up a little bit earlier and taking a walk or doing something that um, is some yoga or meditating that can, you know is, is really serving that quiet time um, when you stay up really late what happens is that you do sort of reset your your body clock and you're not getting enough rest and rest is where we integrate all kinds of things from our day and we refuel our body but we also refuel our brain so um, maybe try to set some timers or, or cut your lateness back by 15 minutes per day so that you have a little bit more time just to get extra sleep Erica it's been really challenging to advocate for my high school kids in high school excuse me, challenging for, to advocate for my high school kids with ADHD. Yes, it is. In high school in particular, kids switch classes, um, they're expected to be more, um, you know, uh, autonomous, and schools are, are often less um, engaged in offering the support they need, unless, you know, there's a big neon sign that, uh, that the uh, IEP has set in front of them. Uh, or the 504. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been great to be here and to talk about this topic, which is near and dear to my heart. Please feel free to um, download the, uh, the the handout that I shared with you. And um, uh, I do want to just say, Marissa, you go to a spa close to house for a massage or 30 minutes to the gym, bravo for you. I'm all about that. That sounds great. Something that can really be for you. One of the reasons I like to exercise pretty much every day, do something, is because it's the one thing I can do for myself that nobody else can take away from me. So what is that one thing you can do for yourself? That's going to be the, the first drop in your bucket. Take care. Um, I will not be here next Friday, but I will be back the following Friday. So enjoy these two weeks, and I'll see you soon. Bye.